This is Sciographies, an introduction to the people who make science happen. I'm your host, David Barkley. I'm an oceanographer with the Faculty of Science here at Dalhousie University. And on Sciographies, I interview different types of scientists about what shaped their interests, their career path, and how they get their research ideas. Thanks for joining us. In this episode, we talk to Dr. Michael Freund. He's a material scientist whose chemical research informs the design of sensors, electrical devices, and energy storage technologies. He's also the director of Dalhousie's Clean Technologies Research Institute, where he facilitates the resources and funding needed to conduct studies that can lead to a more sustainable future. Dr. Freund talks to us about growing up in Florida, trying to design sensor arrays that work with machine learning to mimic our ability to detect and recognize scents, and the collaborative effort between fields to develop new materials and technologies. So you were born in Florida, is that right? Yeah, I was born in Gainesville, Florida. Okay. It's very rural in Mm -hmm. north central Florida. Relatively rural, but it's a pretty decent sized town, right? Gainesville? Well, Gainesville was built around the university. I think when I was there, it was 60,000 students. Mm -hmm. And maybe the um, population maybe was twice that. Yeah. You know, so it was it was really when school was out, the place was empty. Yeah. And when school was starting, it was hopping. And when there was a, a football game, the streets were empty and right. you would hear the, <laughs> the, you know, the, the stadium erupting. Yeah. yeah. Was your family an academic family? Um, my father, he immigrated to Ottawa from Germany after World War Two. Mm-hmm. And he was, you know, trained as a doctor, but he always liked academia and he gave up a fairly lucrative job in Chicago to move to Gainesville to become an academic. Okay. And that's what really turned me on to research was yeah. just hearing about what he was doing. He was studying the brain and okay. the effect of alcohol and aging on the brain. Mm-hmm. And uh, growing up in sort of a university town, I guess it's a bit hard to know any other life, or did, or did, did you kind well, of... Well, it's always around you. The university yeah. <laughs> is, is there. Um, so, I mean, so just to clarify, you were like, it was definite you were going to university, and you went to University of South Florida? I, I went or, to... I, I, first, I went to a very prominent southern university, which I found was... And I was interested in chemistry. Yeah. And I it just... I found that I had to move, because okay. there it was all pre-med, and, yeah, right. And I just, I became very disillusioned and wanted to find a smaller school where I could focus on chemistry and actually sure. get into the lab. And so right. Florida Atlantic University is where right. I ended up. Okay. And you didn't want to become a doctor, though? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. That's the one thing my father <laughs> taught me was that I did not want to become a doctor because uh, okay. he just worked insane hours and... And I just wasn't really into dealing with okay, people but in pain. And, chemistry, pretty close. Yeah. Right. Uh, you went to do your undergrad, but it was also just a given you were going to go to grad school. Like that nope. was. No. Nope. I think my parents were always very, you know, whatever you want to do, but just get an education sure. and get a job. Mm-hmm. And so I wasn't really pushed. And then once I decided to go to graduate school, I think they were pleased with that. And do, so how did you kind of choose your, your field of research? That was, was that from undergraduate experience? Or? Yeah, so yeah. In my undergraduate experience, uh, I worked with a Professor Frank Schultz, who was an electrochemist. Mm-hmm. So that's where I really got interested in electrochemistry. And then when I was starting to think about graduate schools, he encouraged me to apply to Caltech. Yeah. Because he had gotten his undergraduate degree there sure. and had knew all the people you know, I didn't get in. <laughs> it wasn't even close. But he was very encouraging in that way. So, yeah. So can you tell us what was your PhD in a nutshell there? Uh, I got my PhD at the University of Florida. Mm-hmm. And they have a very strong analytical chemistry division. So mm-hmm. it's all about detection, sensitivity, selectivity, stability. But in electrochemistry, it's all about understanding the material because it's that interface with molecules that then undergo electron transfer reactions. Mm -hmm. Any adsorption fouling can affect that. So, uh, and there's a lot of things you can do to facilitate it and catalyze it. So I was very interested in new materials that could be used for electrodes for detection. Okay. At the time, there was a lot of interest in organic superconductors, charge transfer Mm -hmm. salts that are, were actually, uh, electronically conducting. Mm-hmm. And so I started using it as an electrode material and understanding uh, the reactions that could take place at that and how it could catalyze reactions. And 
that allowed me to, to get into DuPont uh, for a summer working mm -hmm. with somebody who was an expert with those materials. Right. And so that's how I got into those organic electrode materials yeah. and eventually got into conjugated polymers, or some people call them conducting polymers. We think of polymers as insulators, you sure. know, wrapping Plastics around, and, yeah, yeah, wrapping around wires and things like that. Mm -hmm. But there are some that have elect really interesting electronic properties. So that's mm -hmm. during my PhD, I got into that as well. Okay, so it's not so much uh, trying everything, putting everything you can like uh, into solutions, see what happens, but starting with defined experiments and iterating. Oh, absolutely! In a way where you understand the effect yeah. of each step. Yeah, and that's what you when you when you're reading the literature. And you're around really good researchers. Mm -hmm. It's not only the you know the system that they're studying; it was how they did the design of the experiment. Right. And that's something that you always aspire to, which is more subtle yeah. uh, than you know studying a material. It's how do you you know what property, and how do you do it? Sure. Uh, and then present the information in in that way that allows others to reproduce, like yeah. critically important. To reproduce it and then writing how yeah. to, some of the, and, and Nate Lewis, the, the person I did my, my postdoc with was really an amazing communicator of scientific concepts. I don't know if you've ever heard of Jason. Jason yeah. uh, is an organization that advises the, the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And he was like one of the first chemists that was invited yeah. because he could speak to the physicists yeah. And he could speak to the engineers. Sure. And he was always really good at explaining things in a way that, you know, a high school student could understand. A sure. really complex subject. Yeah, yeah I think uh, anyone who can write a two-page paper and get yeah. it published is, has, has mastered the art of science exactly. communication, I'd say. I have not published a two-page paper, in case you're wondering. <laughs> no. But I would like to. I've read them, and wow, I love them. Yeah. yeah. It's an interesting topic, for sure. In, yeah, in this field of, of new materials and, mm -hmm. and trying to, trying to uh, find new ways to use materials or push their, their limits, uh, I mean, there must be a lot of excitement yeah, and yeah. some pressure to, to make progress. Has yeah. there ever been a time where you're trying to see meaning in measurements that wasn't there? Yeah. Oh, things that are too good to be true? I mean... Yeah. You have hypotheses, and then you have yeah. to test them, and yeah. then you put them to the test. And sometimes, you know, if it's if it's not reproducible, then it, there's nothing you can do about sure. that. And so you have to change directions. You know, there's been times where you have a hypothesis, and it doesn't pan out the way you want it to. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you can't be too invested yeah. in yeah. that. Yeah. And one of the things I've learned throughout my career is that, you know, you can't be afraid of failure. And you have to have confidence that you'll have new ideas yeah. because you find a lot of people out there. And I've heard stories where somebody will come into somebody else's lab as a competitor and they'll turn all the chemicals <laughs> in the glove box to face the other way so they can't see what they're using. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And when it when it really gets like that, then, you know, people publish and they don't give the whole story. Yeah. And then it's hard to reproduce. You know, my experience at Caltech was really, it was really interesting because people were very open. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if somebody else beats you to the punch and solves the problem, then there's sure. always another problem, you yeah. know, and they always, you know, what's next? Mm -hmm. Keep moving. It wasn't a competition to a finish line. It was always an ongoing process. Yeah. I, I find that the more I talk about my ideas, the more people set me straight mm -hmm. onto onto the right track. It's, yeah. It is a faster way to and get collaborations to, yeah. with people in other fields, because like we work with these electronic materials, mm -hmm. and I think of well, I know how a, how a diode works or a field effect transistor works, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe my material could do the same thing. Sure. And then you talk to an electrical engineering, it's like, you know, don't even try to do that. Because <laughs> if you do that, it's never going to get into a foundry where they sure. make devices. Sure, you sure. Know, they won't allow that chemistry in. Yeah. And uh, you'll never uh, compete with silicon and right. what it can do. Yeah. But, you know, I had one uh, colleague say, if you could make a bit, a memory bit, mm -hmm. you know, an on-off. Yeah. And you could do that reproducibly. Then, you know, the, these materials have different scaling properties, and it mm -hmm. may really solve a real technical problem. They can keep you on the straight and narrow, but they can also point you in new directions that you sure. haven't thought about 
or realize the, what their challenges are. And then you think about your material in a completely new way. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a memory of the, your first big new idea? Let's see. My first new idea, I remember the, the person I did my, my postdoc with was Nate Lewis. Mm -hmm. He had this idea of trying to um, mimic olfaction. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm still working in today. Yeah. It was after this big meeting, a lot of electrochemistry, because everybody's doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, let's do something completely different. And uh, at the time, there was uh, machine vision was just really emerging. And there was a mm -hmm. guy at, at Caltech there named J.J. Hopfield, who was kind of a, a godfather of neural networks. And he was very interested in olfaction mm -hmm. because uh, the neural processing is different. Sure. So Nate talked me into trying to come up with a you know an input device for artificial sure. olfaction, yeah. and so when he first approached me with that, I was like, "That's the weirdest thing I've ever heard of." <laughs> and as a as an analytical chemist, it's like sensitivity, selectivity, stability. You know, you want to make a sensor that lasts yeah. forever yeah. and no nothing will interfere with. The olfactory system is completely different. I mean, it's designed mm -hmm. to react to everything. Right. And the receptors are crummy analytical <laughs> sensors, really. So that was really kind of the, the first time I went into something completely different, completely new idea. And it was very exciting. And so we were able to move quickly and do some of the first early work on it. There was mm -hmm. some work done in, in, in England before, but we were one of the, the first to really expand this area. And then I, I had to graduate, I mean, move on and start my own academic career, yeah. which meant I had to do something different because yeah. this was exploding yes. in his group. It's like, you know, you do something different. Yeah. But I came back to it because it's still not solved. Sure. So the first time you wrote it up, did you actually get your first submission rejected? No, it no. was the okay, Proceedings good. of the National Academy of Sciences uh, paper, bad, three papers, yeah. the three pages. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was where it was all kind of put together and it was really felt good. Mm -hmm. And, and was uh, this experimental work or a theoretical work? It was experimental, but then there was a lot of, uh, you know, I've always been interested in artificial neural networks yeah. and, and computation and, mm -hmm. you know, not theoretical computation, but just data analysis. Yes. And so we did a lot of, you know, um, statistical analysis to show that, in fact, it was doing what it's supposed to do. Sure. And that is differentiate between different chemicals. Right. So that's the question I really want to ask you. What was it supposed to do? Were you supposed to be smelling a particular chemical, detecting a particular chemical with a certain sensitivity? or? Well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, for us, it's supposed to detect anything mm -hmm. and anything new. Right. And create some signature that's unique mm -hmm. that the brain can then understand. Sure. So that's what, that's what it was designed to do. Even it, simpler question. Okay. <laughs> um, our olfactory system, is it a suite of sensors or is it one sensor that's very general? Well, it's uh, Axel and Buck got the Nobel Prize in Medicine, I think, in 2004, maybe, okay. for doing uh, the work. The, to really find out how many distinct olfactory receptors there are. Okay. And they were able to show that there's a thousand in, you know, that are, that's, that's in the biological sure. yeah. library. And although we have millions, they're replicates of those thousand. And yeah. then they were able to also show that depending on the species, we use a different number of them. I think mice use like 300. Okay, okay. Humans, you know, on the order of 100 and some. Mm -hmm. So they are broadly responsive. Mm -hmm. So that means any one receptor will respond to a bunch of things. Okay. But differently. Yeah. And any one thing will cause a bunch of receptors right. to respond. So that's the pattern. Yeah. So we basically have this extremely large basis set of measurements, but they are not independent, right? They're... It's the way they, they all process together. And so is the electronic approach similar? You have a lot of different sensors that you're going to yep. fuse all the data together and make a decision from? Yep. And so it generates a pattern. And uh, you have to train it to recognize it. Okay. What's really cool about it, it and the challenge is that whenever you have a chemical interaction, mm -hmm. there's a chance that it's irreversible. Yes. Or you know something that's organic degrades. Mm -hmm. It reacts with oxygen and light and all the things that cause organics to break down. 
if you think of your iPhone and your imaging chip in there, that thing is rock solid. Right. Will, your, your battery will die before that chip dies. Sure. So light interacting with semiconductor in a device like that mm-hmm. is very stable. It's similar in the retina. If you get retinal detachment, you're, you, know, you might adjust to it to some degree, but you're not sure. going to replace those photoreceptors. Mm-hmm. Um, in the olfactory system, we're constantly turning them over. Right. So every time there, you smell something and it damages the sensor, yeah. your body's able to renew that sensor pretty right. quickly. And it's not that it recognizes it's been damaged, but they just get turned over. They're just doing it all the time. And they're okay. constantly being rewired it's good to into know. the system. So that's very different. And so yeah. I spent a lot of time trying to interact with my computer science colleagues to get them interested. Because everybody's into machine vision. You mm-hmm. know, it's, uh, I was like, well, let's, you know, try to use some of these ideas on this Sure. Other system that presents different challenges, because yeah. you walk into a room, you pick up you know odors in the room, mm-hmm. but now you've zeroed them out. Right, you're not even you don't even notice them. Mm-hmm. So it's all it's not about absolute detection of a particular thing. But is that that's so, happening at the brain level, or that's happening at the sensor level? I think it's happening at the brain level because right, we do that with sound as well, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, exactly. So yeah. you're you're learning how to kind of zero it out. Mm-hmm. And you can do that by looking at differentials, right? So, sure. and the big problem with chemical sensors is drift. So when it drifts, is it just drifting or is it, there's a change in concentration gradually over time, which right. is it, you know? <laughs> yeah. And if you're trying to detect blood sugar levels, you know, in diabetes, that can be death if, you know, right. you, you got to know. And, uh, but in the olfactory system, it's, you know, you will have drift, and so our, our latest work is trying to figure out ways to, to deal with that. And we use the mammalian system as, a, as an inspiration mm-hmm. of ideas of how one might do that. So just to go back to simplify the question again, is the electronic analog, is it a system where the sensor is constantly renewed? Or is it a system where you have to kind of calibrate it constantly? Or how, how do you deal with that to gen- do the same thing the body does? Right. Well, it's something, you know, the sensors that we have will last, you know, months, mm-hmm. but they'll change. And yeah. so it's, it is about retraining or recalibrating. Yeah. And uh, if you look at the differential responses, sure. they don't change as much. Mm-hmm. So what we're really exploring now is how, you know, how much of a problem it is and what can we do. Sure. You know, in chemistry and physics, one way of dealing with a noisy environment is by uh, locking in on a certain frequency. Mm-hmm. And so we were thinking about how maybe that's the way animals do it. And sure. when I was back at, at Caltech, in my, I, was, I was there at, t- at two points in my career. One is mm-hmm. a postdoc and one is a, uh, as a director of a center and an institute there. When I was back there for the second time, there was uh, something called a MURI, which is a military university right. research something. And it's it's funded group that gets together and talks about different, you know, big mm-hmm. topics. And they were doing olfaction. And I can't remember if it was Axel or Buck. I think it was Buck that was part of that. Uh, so you had the biochemists and the biologists to the medicine folks to mm-hmm. the um, to the the chemists and the computational folks there's just a whole group of really bright people there and there was one person in medicine they were doing an MRI of the head and the sinus cavity we actually modulate the airflow through our sinuses over time mm-hmm. and I just thought that was the most amazing thing and he was able to show that where the flow rate was highest you were more sensitive to lower vapor pressure analytes. Than, okay. And we, we actually did a, publish a paper where we were controlling flow as a way to, to control performance. Right, right. And more recently, we were thinking about that some more. And it's like animals, you know, are constantly breathing, right? So we're modulating flow. You breathe in, you breathe in what's in the environment over the receptors, receptors respond, you breathe out. When you think about it, your lungs are one of the best filters. It's probably just CO2, water, and not much else. Mm-hmm. So you're on, off, on, right, off right, as you're right. breathing in That's and out. So you're modulating yeah, at a certain yeah. frequency. And then, you know, animals like mice, they'll, they'll, mm-hmm. when they start tracking, they'll start sniffing at different frequencies. It's like yeah. so there must be something going sure, on there. Sure, sure. And uh, 
I wasn't really keen on trying to replicate that, you know, especially because we're trying to get to a chip, something small. Yes. So we were thinking about other ways of modulating and temperature okay. was what we ended up on. And it actually okay. works. You can very easily modulate the temperature of a sensor. And when you do, if something's partitioning in, as you warm it up, yeah. it pushes it off. Right. So by heating and modulating it, yeah, uh, you're pushing it off and on, off and on. And then that's a way of measuring partitioning. And then you get rid of the low frequency drift, right? as well as other high frequency things that you don't want. Sure. And so we're kind of going down that path right yeah. now. Cool. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah, so when you when, so when you left Caltech to to take up a faculty position at Lehigh, uh, you said you had to generate a new line of thinking, your own kind of lab ideas to take with you. And so so how did you go about that? I had lots of ideas on, you know, using neural networks for analytical chemistry problems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I had an interest in using the kind of the sensor array idea, but with electrochemistry. So in the liquid phase as opposed yeah. to in the gas phase. And then I had a lot of ideas for surface modification. Okay. And then I was also I also had an idea, I think I had four proposals, making an organic neural network. And th- this was kind <laughs> of really far off. And, and a lot of these ideas come from, you know, work I had seen, right? Mm-hmm. And ideas that popped into my head, well, what about this? Uh, with these organic conductors, as you grow them electrochemically, it's like electroplating, but... Yeah. Uh, if you control the conditions, you can actually get fractal growth. Right. So you're basically growing neurons exactly. at some point. <laughs> exactly. And uh, and so uh, and when you grow them, when so the question is, how do you make connections, mm-hmm. and how do you control the weight of those connections? Because that's right. how a neural network is sure. is grown. And so that was one proposal. I remember giving that talk, and Nate going. That's weird. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, once I had my job and my, my PhD advisor, she said, come up with your proposals yeah. and then immediately start working on your next proposals. Sure. Because you submit them, everybody sees them. And sure enough, somebody who never worked in this area mm-hmm. had a paper in science doing exactly that. Wow. And... That was the only paper he ever published on the topic, and it was just like, oh, I could see the connections there. Huh. But uh, in any event, that's how I came up with my ideas. And you just, looking in journals once you start, because you have to build and it takes time, you'd open up journals and with fear, you know, you're yeah. looking through to see who's <laughs> actually done it. And it's, you know, it's not people are stealing your ideas. It's, there's lots of people thinking about the same stuff. Mm-hmm. And even if they see your proposal, you know, it doesn't mean that they're like, hey, let's steal his idea. It's like, oh, yeah, we had that idea and it's been sitting on the back bench. Yeah. And we've got it halfway done. We better yeah. get it in gear. Yeah. Um, you know, whatever. That's where the, you know, the joy of coming up with new ideas has got to be there. Otherwise, academia can be pretty uh, tough. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if I answered your question. No, no, it, do, it does. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I, I feel very similarly. Can't worry about people stealing because uh, you're right. I think there's a kind of collective consciousness within our mm-hmm. various subfields where you know, the main thing to do is to try to zig when everyone's zagging, if you can, right? Yeah, like, trying to be new and innovative yeah. and, and and figuring out something new. And that's that's when you get the two-page paper. Where right. It's just like, oh, wow, <clears throat> this yeah. is something really new and different. Now, I, I'm a little bit curious how you ended up in Canada. I married a Canadian. Uh, <laughs> my wife came down from Winnipeg. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, she was she got her undergraduate at the University of Winnipeg, did a master's at U of T, and then came down to the University of Florida to work with somebody in particular. And so we met there. And she's also a chemist. At the time, CFI and Canada Research Chair programs were yeah. starting. Yeah. And there's an opening at the University of Winnipeg, which is her hometown. Mm-hmm. So family, relatives, and everything yeah. there. So... If we were ever going to try it, that was yeah. the time to do it. And it was a great experience for me, the move. Yeah, and with the, when I moved to U of M, I still had strong contacts with the people at yeah. Caltech. And, and so, the re- research themes kind of remained throughout your work mm-hmm. there. Yep. Yeah. And there was a big transition to uh, artificial photosynthesis okay. that was uh, working on various aspects of what would be required to actually achieve artificial photosynthesis. Mm-hmm. So the idea is light energy into chemical energy. 
And that's where I really started moving to energy. Okay. So how did you end up coming to Dow? Well, they created a, the Clean Technologies Research Institute. Uh, before that, it was the Institute for Research and Materials, led by Marianne White. And I was very familiar with that because I built an institute at Manitoba mm-hmm. around materials. And so okay. I was very familiar with Dow. And so when they were looking for a director for the Clean Technology Research Institute, I was yeah. very interested in, in doing that. If you go to the website, you'll see that it's really quite broad. Yeah. It includes advanced manufacturing. So that's a clean technology. If, you, mm-hmm. if you're if you using a CNC mill and drilling away a lot of materials, there's a lot of waste there. If you do 3D printing, it's yeah. it's additive manufacturing. It's a lot more robust. And so we've got experts here working in metals and ceramics Mm -hmm. in in those areas Mm -hmm. we also have people in the the clean water space you know how to treat water how to monitor water uh we've got people in the energy space and with uh, jeff don and mark obervac and now uh new hires there's you know promise in the future in in batteries we have researchers in photovoltaics and then Myself and uh, Mita Dizog, who I think you've also interviewed, yep. um, are working in, you know, water splitting, basically. Sure. I mean, the CTRI is very broad in, in that sense. And so my role there is to facilitate the researchers learning about what everybody's doing, going after large funding opportunities. Mm-hmm. This is the Canada Foundation for Innovation, which pays for the multi-million dollar infrastructure that no individual researcher could right. could justify. But in order to have the federal government fund us, we need to propose innovative new ideas. Uh, we also go after things like Enser Create programs. So these yeah. are multi-investigator funding for uh, student training. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I'm involved in putting together proposals like that, again, to, to support the, the wider community. And, and so these are ongoing things that we need to keep going after. So it's a lot of fun. And I think, you know, when we talk about advancing through a career, uh, you know, it's when I was an assistant professor, it was like, oh, my God, you know, it's like yeah. I've got to do all these things. And then getting tenure is a big deal because then you've proved yourself able to to continue on by running a group and, and operating at a high level. And then once you get to the full professor level, you know, I, I really started thinking about, uh, you know, what else? And so mm-hmm. I became very interested, and this is what happened at the University of Manitoba, is going after large grants, yeah. putting teams together, mm-hmm. doing things that were more than just my own group. Sure. And, you know, it is very rewarding to put together something bigger. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. It's been a fascinating discussion. In our next episode, we'll talk to Dr. Kevin Hewitt, a physicist working on optical diagnostic tools for disease detection. I'm your host, David Barkley. Thanks for listening. Geographies is brought to you by Dalhousie University's Faculty of Science and CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Our producer is Nicole Killowy. You can learn more about Geographies at dal.ca slash Geographies.